Good evening, everybody. Lovely to see so many of you again. Uh, David is a, a distinguished scholar, Dr. David. He's, he has a, a, a senior role in, in uh, uh, further education, and um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy his talk. Uh, before we go into that, I have just been lucky enough because I, I was given an advanced copy to complete reading Rebecca Solnit's new book, All World's Roses. Um, it is easily the most interesting and refreshing book I've read about All World for an awful long time. Um, you will have received from Neil um, notice of the 21st of next month for her talk. Um, it's like the ones we had earlier in the year with Richard and for Sylvia. It's one where we would encourage you to invite as many people as you would like uh, by forwarding the email that uh, Neil sent you to anybody who you would think might be interested in, in uh, hearing from Rebecca. So thank you very much for that. I look forward to taking your questions and passing them to, to David at, at the end of his talk. But over to you now, David. Well, thank you um, very much, uh, Quentin and Neil. Um, you've been uh, great uh, stalwarts and helps, um, as usual, in the preparation of this talk, especially from the um, technical side. And um, I'd just like to welcome all um, members of the Orwell Society um, um, in this evening or this afternoon or this morning, wherever you're watching this um, in the world, and also um, anyone who's interested in um, joining the Orwell Society. Um, um, please do so, anybody who's having a, um, a peek in. So um, I want to look at the um, broad theme of Orwell dictatorship and the Cold War in the historical period 1936 to 1948 and how this informed Orwell's writing. Now at the outset I just want to say I don't pretend to be um, any um, versed literary critic or um, or literary type. Um, I'm actually a lecturer in history and the Cold War is my, um, is my sort of specialist field if I had one. And um, I'm a firm believer in that, uh, in that, in that literary theory that uh, if you understand the context, then you can understand um, the man or you can understand the writer. And I want to look at this period, which began as a transformative formative period, um, I feel, in George Orwell's uh, writing and um, approach um, to literature in general. So I felt it was driven um, by history. Orwell is a realist and um, he is picking up on events around him. And that's the vein in which I will move um, forward. Um, I want to essentially focus this talk on two arguments. Um, firstly, that George Orwell's writing genres were transformed by the emergence of dictation dictatorships between 1936 and the emergence of the Cold War in the 1940s. And the second argument that Orwell believed that dictatorship could never take hold in Britain because it was so anathemic to British values. So let's uh, let us begin. Um, I was recently reading a, um, a Guardian extract which um, quoted um, DJ Taylor, one of um, the leading, leading critics um, of Orwell, um, who described his early work before 1936 um, as being um, pedestrian in some cases and sub um in other in others. But for me, um, it's the it's the publication of George Bowling's breakdown in um, Coming Up for Air, 
which um, sharpens up, I feel, um, Orwell's um, worldview and his transformation as a writer. Now, Coming Up For Air was published in 1939, and this came, of course, after Orwell's um, own experiences in Spain during the Spanish Civil War and um, also the transformation of Germany from democracy to dictatorship in 1933 and the Moscow trials of 1937. So there's plenty of material which was then bearing down on Orwell by 1937 to 39 when um, coming up for air was um, was published and um he obviously um, escaped um, Orlov's crematorium um, during the Spanish Civil War and um, he, he you know, saw the events in Moscow um, in 1937 as, um, as an observer. And by 1937, Orwell had clearly developed a distaste of both fascism and orthodox um, communism. And in that, uh, in that, um, that transformative novel, novels of surrounding Bowling's um, Bowling's breakdown, um, is that quote of the jackboots, the castor oil, and the truncheons, which would be spreading um, across Europe and seeing the bombers in the sky. So I think that you know, coming up for air really needs to be seen for what it is, not just some kind of gentle um, social criticism of the 1930s. I think it really, really does need to be seen as a definitive uh, work of. Orwell's um, in terms of his transformation to this um, sharpened writer with the um, with with the world view. Okay, so why does Orwell have such a distaste of um, of dictatorship? And um, you know, we saw in the nineteen by the nineteen thirties, um, so many of the British left seeing the Soviet Union as um, some kind of a model or a way forward. People like Sidney and Beatrice Webb writing in the nineteen um, in, in the nineteen twenties, and so many um, of the left, um, you know, had had great sympathy with um, with the Soviet Union, but Orwell um, takes a distaste of it. Um, in, in pretty early terms, not just because of his experiences um, in Spain, but also remember um, the death in Kalgan in, um, in China of, of his friend and acquaintance, um, Gareth Jones. So do George Orwell's, do, does George Orwell's distaste of tyranny, um, the, the, the tyranny of power, is it actually found more in his school days rather than in his experiences in um, in Spain or what he's observing happening in China and um, the Soviet Union? Now, obviously, or Orwell had the most bourgeois um, of education at um, at Eton, and uh, we can see a little snapshot of him there, um, aged probably about fifteen um, at the bottom. Now, at uh, at Eton, Orwell would have um, obviously experienced much in the form of classic classical education, and uh, would have looked, um, you know, even much pretty much as an overview on the works of Plato. Now, Plato wrote um, his, obviously, his Republic. He obviously wrote tomes on, on power, and uh, he reflected on different types of power. And he defined power as the ability to make people do things. And in the case of tyranny, um, Plato talks about coercion and authority being needed to make people um, comply. And um, Plato puts forward a um, sort of list of conditions for, um, for tyranny um, to occur. And he sees tyranny as something that emerges out of oligarchy, that if um, if power is concentrated into the, into the hands of an elite or a small number of people, then eventually people will rise up and uh, the revolution will create an even worse oligarchy. It will create um, um, tyranny. Now, um, Plato, who you know, no doubt influenced Orwell, um, assault, um, says that tyranny assaults wisdom um, and reason, and, he, and Plato sees these as the highest of, um, of human virtues. And um, with that um, assault by the European dictators on um, wisdom and, um, and, and um, reason, 
then clearly um, Orwell is perhaps reflecting back to um, his reading of Plato as um, as a schoolboy, as a sort of ne as a, a recourse back to the the most basic of um, of Western values. If we bring the analysis of totalitarianism um, totalita totalitarianism um, forward, um, we look at the um, the historian Gilbert Ployger. Now, Gilbert Ployger, um, when he looked at um, um, his study of dictatorships uh, right across um, many years of um, of history, Ployger um, states that they seem to have. Um, similar or very general characteristics which make them pretty much um, the same, seeing them as um, brushstroke solutions to complex problems. And this is why dictatorships um, emerge, because they're seen as these, um, as these sort of great um, solutions. They offer things like um, the perfect um, physical and social state of humankind. Um, says um, says Ploiger, and um, dictatorships have um, a state, and the state is merged with the party, and it's controlled um, by the official party, where things like education, the police, transport, etc., are all brought under the control of the um, of the uh, of the party. There is usually, um, in the vast majority of cases, one omnipotent, charismatic leader uh, who cannot fail. And cannot be um, cannot be wrong, and uh, I mean we've seen this right through um, um, the history of of dictatorships. But dictatorships need coercion, and they can't do um, their coercion um, without the monopolistic control of police and um, and armed forces. And when we look at uh, Nazi Germany, just a bit further down the line, um, we will see that how necessary um, these things were, and also they need. Um, cooperation um, for that coercion uh, from the wider population. If we look at uh, Martin Gilbert's work on the Holocaust, uh, Martin Gilbert argues that um, the Holocaust could never have happened without the cooperation of the vast majority of the people in Germany during the 1930s and early 1940s. So this, this real necessity for the force instruments of the state um, to be under that monopolistic control of, um, of the party. The aim of every dictatorship, um, says Ploiger, is total social control. And um, total social control demands total adherence um, by everybody um, to the ideology of the party and also to the action of um, the party as well. So um, you know, we can see these general conditions, the shopping list or tick box criteria um, of conditions in, um, in dictatorships, says, uh, says Gilbert Ploiger. Moving on to um, fascism um, specifically, now um, George Orwell was very um, dismissive of, um, of fascism and um, if we look at um, say um, the um, Italian writer Umberto Eco, uh, Umberto Eco goes to great lengths to analyse um, fascism obviously in decades um, after Orwell and um, Orwell Orwell sees it um, as just something spurious, something that he um, he dismisses, and um, in doing so, he um, he gets to um, uh, um, in, in the road to Wigan Pier in his diary describes um, going to a meeting of the British Union of Fascists and listening to um, listening to um, Oswald Mosley, and um, in uh, lis listening to Oswald Mosley, um, he describes um, his speech as his usual claptrap. He doesn't go into any analysis at all of what uh, Mosley is saying, what his central messages um, central messages are, and. Um, you know, he um, just seems to sort of did dismiss it um, very much out of hand. However, uh, Umberto Eco, analysing fascism as a coercive totalitarian ideology, um, you know, which emerged in Europe, which spread across Europe like a, a rash or a disease in the 1930s, he produces a shopping list of, um, of sort of um, criteria that or, or things that, uh, that make up um, fascism. Does this mean that George Orwell perhaps didn't understand 
understand the elements of fascism? I doubt that very much. Um, but just George Orwell saw the whole thing as um, as spurious and uh, as a um, you know sort of uh, an English gentleman perhaps didn't uh, didn't take any of its ideas um, on board or saw them as something so ridiculous. But Umberto Eco says that in fascism, that we see um, things like um, you know the idea of um, the sanctity of a nation state based on territorial and ethnic um, ethnic um, features, and that um, people should adhere um, collectively to this, and that um, you know there is no room for disagreement, and there are both internal and external. Um, enemies and that fascism um, needs um, internal and external enemies and that life is permanent warfare against these internal and en um, external um, enemies and also fascism makes up its um, its own vocabulary or or well referred to this as um, as newspeak now um, in doing so in doing so, um, you know, we, we sort of can transform this to Nazi Germany as well as, um, you know, um, Mussolini's Italy. And in G uh, Nazi Germany, we had um, words like Gleichschaltung, uh, which literally means switch to change, which was coined um, by the Nazis as a, um, as a fascist party. So we see in fascism um, this... Um, this idea of, of, of a coercive state based on on nationalism, based on ethnicity, and also based on um, the entrenchment um, of identity, and there can be no disagreement outside of that, and disagreement is seen as um, as treason. And if we come to feminism and um, if, we, if we come to feminism and um, and dictatorship, um, if, we, if we we can look into the case of um, history's only um, modern female dictator, and that was um, Zhang Xing, um, and otherwise known as Madame Mao, she was uh, Mao Zedong's um, last um, last wife, I believe, and um, you know. Um, launched um, the Cultural Revolution to um, essentially reaffirm and purify um, um, Chinese orth Orthodox common, uh, communism after the, um, you know, pretty much the, um, the physical uh, demise of Mao in his, um, in his later years and some awful, dreadful atrocities committed in China um, between 1969 and um, 1974. And um, Harriet Evans, feminist historian, um, says that dictatorships of whatever ideological characters suppress women's rights but they usually um, espouse themselves as champions of, um, of women's rights. And if you want to look at the sort of um, you know, the, um, the power of the female dictator, I'd certainly recommend um, reading Ross Terrell's um, work, Madame Mao, the, um, the White Bowed um, Demon. And uh, for me, I was, I was having a quick conversation with uh, Quentin um, just, uh, just before I started that uh, she is probably history's, you know, certainly uh, most frightening, uh, frightening dictator, very formidable character um, indeed. And um, she hanged herself um, in prison in the, um, in the in about 19, 1981, I think. Okay. So dictatorships um, invariably um, offer a perfect state of mankind, and people are even um, coerced um, into um, physicalness, and um, there was a, always a strong emphasis on um, on sport and uh, physical activity. We can see some images here um, from um, Nazi Germany in the in the nineteen thirties, and you had things like um, the Hitler Youth, where um, boys were pushed through coercive physical activities like um, boxing and running and constant uh, constant sport, and uh, the propaganda poster below, um, you know, clearly articulates the purpose for that. Um, the officers of um, of tomorrow, and um, Hitler himself said he wanted German boys um, to be as hard as Krupp steel and um, as lithe as a um, as a tiger, etc. So, um, you know, being this kind of you know strong, um, I think one of my students used the word buff the other day. Um, 
type of person, all muscly and uh, vigorous and ready to go, and uh, strong and combative um, to be used um, in the dictatorship. Now, um, Hitler um, himself, um, I think, articulated the um, the relationship between um, the person or the citizen and um, the dictatorship, where he said that um, the state does not no longer serves the people as their servant, but actually the state becomes um, their master. So people have to um, toughen themselves up um, to carry out the wishes of um, the state during um, the combative total war in this perfect state um, of humankind, or as they called it at the time, the perfect state of mankind. And we see this commonality right across orthodox communism and Nazism, this, um, this perfect state of, um, of mankind. I don't think it's a, um, a regime I would survive very long in the... Okay. So um, looking at, uh, at the sort of human existence within the dictatorship, um, we can contrast um, Orwell's um, view on um, the human existence in the dictatorship. And again, we see him harking back to um, his Platonistic, um, Platonistic um, um, education. And that is um, the self um, in the dictatorship and the loss of the self as well. Now, uh, we can contrast Orwell with um, the later historian um, Helmut um, Laubilcher. And um, Orwell wrote, I believe, in 1984 that in a dictatorship, the only freedom is the few cubic centimeters of conscience inside. Um, your skull and um, everything else um, is seen by the state and is controlled by the state. And um, does this inform the German historian Helmut Laubilcher, who is, um, who is looking back at um, how um, the German population um, cooperated with the evil dictatorship of Nazi Germany? Now, um, Helmut Laubilcher co um, contrasts how um, people were um, raised um, with strong morals um, in Germany in the years leading up to the Nazi um, dictatorship. And other historians have said, well, you know, anti-Semitism and nationalistic feelings were always popular in, um, in, uh, in, in Germany well before the Nazis, so it was easy for them to take hold. But um, Laubilcher, Laubilcher talks about this loss of the self in any dictatorship. And in the case of um, Nazi Germany, um, he says that people had to abandon any semblance of a moral conscience um, so that they personally could survive. And um, if you exercised your moral conscience in any way at all, then um, that was a sure road to, um, to, to certain death. And um, I think he was drawing on um, some of the feelings that, um, that George Orwell had um, about um, the loss of the conscience um, for, um, for, for the human in the, um, in the dictatorship. Dictators um, need um, dictators need um, propaganda. Propaganda is um, something that you know, we could talk a long time about, but um, dictatorships ac absolutely need it because it's a certain type of communication. Um, propaganda cannot. Um, be a dialogue or a conversation that cannot happen um, in a dictatorship or um, any useful propaganda um, you know cannot engage with its um, with the thoughts of its um, recipient um, it must be deployed um, in the most sophisticated ways and um, it must be deployed using um, the most sophisticated um, methods. Now, if we look at um, propaganda, say in uh, Nazi Germany, on the, um, on the on the left hand image here, um, Joseph Goebbels um, centralised the um, the communication and propaganda machine um, of the Nazis in Germany. Um, began this process um, in 1928, and um, you know Goebbels was a professor. Um, of, of, of rhetoric and uh, had a doctorate um, from 
Heidelberg University. Um, he was actually a serious academic before um, before um, getting involved with the um, getting involved um, with the Nazis, and we. Um, we, we, we can see these features, you know, right across both um, national socialist and communist um, propaganda. Um, there must be, um, you know, um, no dialogue, and it is, um, it is in itself um, a unidirectional um, communication, and um, we see that. Um, whichever type of regime is issuing it, um, it's got to shut, propaganda has got to shut down thought and interpretation um, with images and words. Facts and language must be emasculated um, by, um, by propaganda and also it's there to create cooperation and consent. And two great f um, features that we see um, in propaganda um, is fear and are, are, are both fear and salvation so that the audience becomes used to receiving um, messages that you know shut down um, their, their interpretation and create consent um, from them propaganda absolutely essential for um, for any um, you know dictatorship that thinks it's worth its um, its solve Dictatorships must have um, permanent warfare, must have um, both um, internal and external enemies. And Orwell would have been witness um, you know, to things like Joseph Goebbels' um, conference preparing for total war that we see here um, on the left. And also um, the activities of the NKVD, the forerunner of the KGB, that we, um, that we saw in um, the 1920s, I think right through um, the existence of the Soviet Union. Um, and it's... Uh, and it's dreadful, um, dreadful leaders, um, Lavrenty Beria and um, Yezov, um, who you know, directed the purges and um, the mass murders. And I think the pinnacle of these was the um, the events in Moscow um, in 1937-38. Again, um, these informed um, Orwell. So, if we look specifically at the um, the regimes that Orwell um, Orwell witnessed. Um, Germany by by 1936 had become um, a very entrenched um, entrenched um, dictatorship, and um, Germany had German democracy collapsed uh, from the Weimar Republic to um, Hitler's fully fledged dictatorship um, in just 42 days. So, in six weeks, Germany's democratic parliament, the Reichstag. Um, was shut down. Um, the Enabling Act enabled Hitler to rule without the consultation of Parliament. The free trade unions and the free press uh, were shut down and the opposition parties were abolished. So in, within six weeks, Hitler had achieved total social and um, political control. He fulfilled um, you know, m m a number of Gilbert Ploiger's, um, Gilbert Ploiger's criteria. And the camps um, began to open, um, and the dictatorship was well up and running just within um, just within a few um, a few weeks. And in a more complex sense, um, if we look at the establishment of the Soviet Union um, as a um, as a dictatorship, and again, Orwell bore um, bore witness to this with um, you know um, living through that era and um, also sadly in the murder of his um, his friend and acquaintance um, Gareth Jones and um, the Russian historian Dmitry Volkoganov um, described um, the emergence of the Soviet Union as the people's tragedy um, what could have been a viable populist um, revolution that could have brought um, you know um, social mobility, equality and democracy um, to Russia ended up becoming a huge mass murdering um, tragedy. Now um, the, the sort of historical evidence is that Russia was on course for democratic reform as early as 19, um, 1912 and um, there was a social democracy government emerging um, 
in place early in 1917, but the, um, the Bolsheviks hijacked power um, in November 19 and instituted war communism. Now, um, war communism um, essentially was um, the galvanizing of a dictatorship very quickly um, in um, in Russia to deal again with both in real internal enemies the um, the, um, the white armies um, and also the danger of um, invasion from uh, the Western nations and um, Lenin and the Bolsheviks saw um, the establishment of a dictatorship as the best way of, um, of overcoming this and uh, hence we begin the dictatorship um, of the proletariat which followed right through to um, the Joseph Stalin coup of 1928 to 1930, um, culminating um, in the murder of um, Kirov in, in Leningrad. So um, the events in the Soviet Union um, in those early days, you know, laying down um, the foundations of the dictatorship, you know, the opposition parties um, are shut down and the enemies um, internally are beginning to be, um, beginning to, um, to be liquidated. So um, by 1933, there are two huge competing dictatorships um, in Europe um, competing for power, threatening to swallow up um, and to influence and destabilize neighboring states. Now, Orwell wasn't the only um, portender of um, the danger of dictatorships, uh, whether it was Nazi Germany um, or the, um, the Soviet Union. Um, William C. Bullitt, an American diplomat um, in 1936, um, gave a, um, a chilling report to President Roosevelt. Um, America decided to um, end its um, puzzled, um, puzzled confusion with the Soviet Union um, in 1934. Um, the revolution um, had obviously um, you know, succeeded in Russia by 1924, and um, Russia had essentially um, put down the barriers to constructive relationships with, um, with foreign powers. And um, America decided to make some overtures because the rest of the world was rather puzzled at uh, so what was happening in the, um, the Soviet Union. And um, in 1934, President Roosevelt decided to assign an ambassador um, and open up diplomatic relations with the um, Soviet Union. And part of that um, initial um, ambassadorial team, um, who was the first secretary at the American Embassy at Moscow, was William C. Bullitt. Now, Bullitt was, um, was charged essentially with an economic and political intelligence uh, mission during his time in, um, in Moscow. And he was asked to basically essentially get out and about, talk to people, talk to to um, Soviet politicians and um, talk to people in the street and gather as much um, information as you can about what, what is happening in the Soviet Union and uh, what its worldview is. And um, Bullitt sent um, a very chilling report back to um, President Roosevelt and also um, that was shared with the State Department in, um, in Washington. And William C. Bullitt said, People will readily tell you that the Soviet Union is preparing for a war against the capitalist nations. And people believe that there will be a war involving the Western nations of Europe and Germany. And the final line of um, Bullock's report was this nation, the Soviet Union, will become a great danger to the free world. Um, so you see a great deal of accuracy in, um, in Bullet's um, prophecy, um, or was, um, was everything just so blatant anyway um, at this time that war was perhaps um, inevitable, even though the appeasers um, in Britain and in Europe were um, doing their best to try and, um, try and avoid it. But Bullet talks about the latent danger of the Soviet Union as um, a precursor or pre-element um, to, um, to that war, which eventually did engulf, engulf the whole of, uh, whole of Europe. So 
Well, we get to World War II, and um, it's um, it's sort of flaring up um, in terms of a total war between the um, the dictatorships. Um, now, the World War II was arguably engineered by Stalin, but you know clearly um, Hitler had uh, intentions of uh, launching a war in um, in Europe. Um, you have to ask the question about um, the sort of dictatorship-led Soviet Union. Why was the Western frontier of the Soviet Union uh, across Belarus and Ukraine barely defended with a war going on in um, in neighbouring states? And how, why was it so easy for um, the um, armies of Nazi Germany to basically cut a swathe right through the Western um, Soviet Union. Did the Soviet dictatorship want um, a war of, uh, of its own? Well, the fact that it was left so relatively undefended and uh, Stalin ordered the, the man from Belarus who phoned Moscow to say um, that the German armies were on their way, Stalin ordered him um, to, be, um, um, to be shot. So the war, um, Operation Barbarossa, um, the attack on the Soviet Union, uh, one dictatorship attacking another, um, goes on with incredible ferocity um, between 1941 and, um, and 43. And then there's a rollback, obviously, in February 1943 from, um, from Stalingrad. Um, the German forces are turned back and the intelligent thinking among the, um, the German lead military leadership is that essentially uh, the Russians are coming and um, this is going to end up in a in an annihilation um, across Europe and in in Germany. Now, um, while the rollback was happening um, on the road back to the back to Germany, um, Dean Rusk, who was the head of um, America's um, Office of Naval Intelligence um, at this time, um, wanted to find out what was happening in those countries that were being. Um, reclaimed where the Germans were being driven out by the Soviet forces and he placed agents and reporters um, in countries like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania um, and Hungary and um, Rusk gathered some um, interesting reports which he then obviously shared with Roosevelt and the State Department and he described a process of um, Sovietization and um, in that process of, um, of Sovietization, Rusk described how um, democratic politicians who hadn't fled but had uh, gone into hiding in, um, in countries like Poland and Hungary, etc., and Czechoslovakia, um, were being arrested and liquidated by um, the NKVD, um, who had sent units into those countries. Now, um, Rusk raised the question, why is the NKVD in the front line of this, um, of this war? And not only were the NKVD hunting out um, democratic politicians in Central and Eastern Europe, um, the NKVD were also hunting down native um, Communist Party officials as well. So um, the leaders of the Polish Communist Party found themselves um, being arrested, being liquidated and uh, replaced by Stalin's um, placement. So um, Rusk came up with the um, description, so, um, a process of Sovietization, and that he predicted that there would be a remodeling of these states on, um, on Soviet lines. And uh, it was a process that he warned um, Roosevelt about, but I'm not sure how much notice um, Roosevelt um, actually took um, of, uh, of Rusk's um, report. And we get to Yalta. Um, in May '45, and um, Orwell again is, you know, he, he again is the um, the observer um, at this time, and um, the two um, the two democracies um, have had to engage with um, the dictator of the East, Stalin, um, to bring about the defeat of uh, the dictatorship that was threatening them, um, Nazi Germany, and um, there's a tremendous distrust. Um, of Stalin at, um, at Yalta. Um, 
Roosevelt is unwilling to really enter into a discussion with him about the emergence or the development um, of the atomic bomb. Um, Churchill wants um, a reaffirmation of the British Empire, but America is calling the shots. Now, Stalin leaves Yalta pretty well insulted because um, the Soviets are pretty well instructed to um, pack their bags and um, and go back home after losing nearly 20 million um, fighters. And um, also the Soviets received no guarantee um, about the integrity of their Western um, frontiers. So um, Yalta is a, Yalta is a, um, pretty much a disaster as far as the um the russians are concerned and they become aware of new threats um against the um the dictator um uh, the dictatorship and we get um moving towards um you know this polarization of the um of the world into two camps now um was it dictatorship that caused um the cold war or was it dollar imperialism um, there is the other side of the argument, there's the other historical argument, um, that the Cold War was caused by um, America's behaviour over the um, atomic bomb, which of course we'll come to in just a second um, in Orwell's, um, Orwell's later, later writing. Um, Dean Acheson, um, who was um, Harry Truman's um, Secretary of, um, of State, um, was a great admirer of um, British um, British imperialism, and um, Harry Truman, you know, um, a real contrast to FDR. Harry Truman was a um, had a small time politician from um, the state of Missouri, very often termed the, ac uh, the accidental president, but a man I kind of um, admire. And uh, Atchison was um, telling telling Truman that um, essentially after the war he believed that America would go back to a state of economic um, recession and that if there was an American presence in Europe then this um, this collection of free nations or, or nations of freedom would um, create a new market for American goods and products and therefore there was a necessity for America economically um, to make itself have a presence in Europe and to, um, to, to essentially um, keep, keep the American economy um, buoyant. And we see um, Orwell's Orwell's reemergence um, in 1945, as um, as the Second World War draws to um, a close, and um, he addresses um, the Duchess of Athol's League for European Freedom. Now, this is a conservative organisation, pretty much what you might call a right wing, but not far right um, organisation. But um, it's uh, it's essentially an anti-socialist um, organisation, and. Um, um, Historian Woodcock, um, um, I believe it's Ian Woodcock, says in 1967 that George Orwell said um, at that meeting of the, um, the League for European Freedom, I belong to the left and must work inside it. Much as I hate, um, much as I hate Russian totalitarianism and its poison, poisonous influence in this country. So um, early up in 1945, um, Orwell, you know, is still espousing his love of um, socialism and um, his hatred of orthodox, um, orthodox communism, and that's you know still informing um, his writing. Now, across Europe in this in these sort of post-war years, um, we have um, a process um, that, that sort of takes over after um, so part of Sovietization. That is what Robert Professor Robert Conquest described as nation breaking, in which um, essentially nine Central and Eastern European countries were brought under the yoke of the socialist uh, the Soviet dictatorship, um, and um, effectively socialized, so, so Sovietized. And this meant, um, th this essentially meant that sovereignty, national sovereignty would, um, would disappear, as would um, nationally elected um, and indigenous governments and things like anthems and armies 
were brought under Sovietized um, party control. So you had this real, you know, sort of creation of um, of sort of nine Sovietized um, states um, um, during these these years, 1944 to 56, which Orwell found um, so so alarming um, at this um, at this time with the um, with the nation breaking. Uh, one example um, was obviously Poland. If we want to drill down to um, to, to, to what to, to what one example, um, in between 1946 and 47, um, we, we see here that if we look at the map, um, that um, Poland was territorially morphed um, by the um, uh, by the by the Soviets, um, and Churchill and Roosevelt um, agreed to this. And the Polish government in exile was de-recognized. Um, by the Soviets um, early on um, in 1943 and later de-recognized by um, the Western powers. And um, native Polish communists were, um, and Democrats, they were liqu liquidated by um, the Polish um, um, Workers' Party and their police unit, um, the ZOMO. And then the, um, the great deception, the three-tack referendum, um, created the, the Sovietized state and economy and Gomulka um, was installed for um, for decades, um, and then it came the territorial adjustment and the ethnic cleansing of um, people of German heritage out of um, out of Poland. So we see its effects, and you know the, the same kind of effects happened in places like Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, um, Czechoslovakia. In October 45, Orwell's um, reflection on that whole um, sad situation um, in Europe between 1943 and 1945, um, that short but very um, influential and summative article, You and the Atomic um, Bomb. And in You and the Atomic Bomb, um, Orwell um, describes his fears of um, the prospect of um, nuclear conflict um, in the future. And he believes that um, within five years um, that uh, Britain would become a, um, a target. And um, he said that the proliferation of the bomb um, in that symbolic last um, paragraph, uh, the proliferation of the bomb would create um, the end of national sovereignty and highly centralized police states. So the bomb itself, even without being um, deployed or exploded, um, created fear and created its own um, police state. And this is where we see Orwell first using um, the phrase Cold War. Now, the phrase Cold War is attributed to an American politician in 1947, Bernard Baruch, but it was in fact um, Orwell. But again, um, um, there is um, there is some historical evidence which I actually couldn't find was that this uh, phrase was actually used in 1938 um, to describe um, Europe on the brink of war, um, but I haven't been able to find that. But Orwell is credited before Bernard Baruch um, of using that phrase, the, um, the Cold War, and this is where it appears in You and the um, Atomic Bomb, and he describes how it um, creates this kind of polarity um, around the world. And still, the dictators thrive, and uh, you know we um, we uh, we do see in in North Korea, in Russia, um, and also in the nineteen seventies to the nineties in Chile and China um, the conditions of of dictators, the loss of the self. That's what they all need. They need fear, coercion, and they need cooperation. And of course, um, as Orwell's epilogue um, on dictatorship itself, um, and it's there for everyone to see um, from 1984, um, one does not establish a dictatorship to safeguard a revolution. One makes the revolution in order to establish the dictatorship. And his fear is that all um, revolutions end up in dictatorships. And the object of persecution is nothing but persecution the object of torture is torture, and the object of power is power. And I think that really, you know, if you're going to look at Orwell and um, if you're going to look at Orwell and dictatorship, 
um, I think, first of all, you need to take the antidote medicine, and that's reading The Lion and the Unicorn, Socialism and um, the English Genius, which he wrote in uh, 1941. And um, in this, um, Orwell optimistically states, despite what came after 1941 um, across Europe and um, across the world, Orwell optimistically states that um, dictatorship is an absolute um, anathema um, to the English people and their values. And um, he um, says that the heirs of um, Wellington are in English back gardens and in four ale, um, four ale bars. Dictatorship could never take hold in um, in England, says Orwell. And you know, um, you you kind of you take this warmth from uh, reading the Lion um, and the Unicorn, and uh, you 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 believe that you hope that's true that dictatorship could never um, take hold here, and that uh, despite all of England, I guess Britain's um, inequalities and its flawed electoral system and the bedridden aunts and the old and the silly etc., um, it is optimistically still a great country. So um, thank you for listening to my reflections on um, Orwell and the dictatorship con context in which he finds himself um, from between 1938 and um, 1948. Thank you very much. I'm handing back to you, Quentin. Thank you. Uh, can you take your uh, screen sharing down? There we go. There we go. Um, Let's get the gallery review, then I'll get a better answer. So, uh, question time, Masha, you, you are on the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Hello. Uh, I have, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have uh, one question and one small comment. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is concerning Gareth Jones. Yeah. Do we have any historical evidence at all that they were acquainted, Orwell and Gareth Jones? Because I've been studying Gareth Jones quite uh, intensively. I, I could not find any evidence of them meeting. What we see in the film, Mr. Jones, it yeah. seems to be a poetic license of Andrea Kalu the screenwriter or do you have any any uh, confirmation that they knew each other no i i don't have any confirmation that they knew each other um yet um no um i'm um, a welsh person and a welsh speaker and I, I know very well the the context that gareth jones um was coming from in the newspaper that he worked for the western mail and um one of my missions over um the next couple of years or, or when i can make some time um is to actually firm up um what the relationship was between um, Gareth Jones and um, and George Orwell. Now, um, I've read um, the um, the book The Grain of Truth, um, which was written by one of um, his relatives um, some time ago, and. Um, in that book, um, it talks of a um, basically a, a professional, some kind of professional dialogue, as I remember, between um, Gareth Jones and um, and George Orwell. Now, Gareth Jones spent a lot of time, obviously, in the Soviet Union and um, in China and out was out of Iran and Mongolia while the revolution um, was going on. But it talks about this professional contact. Now, whether the professional contact was some drinks in a pub or just um, some communication across across um, te a telegram or telephone call, um, who knows, but uh, I'm going to pursue this further um, in, um, in, in, in Wales through the, through the archives of that newspaper. But uh, um, in answer to your question, no, I don't have any definitive um, evidence in front of me that they were, um, that, um, that they were actually friends. It's, um, it's, it's just my presumption from the book, um, The Grain of Truth, um, which mentions this professional contact. Right. Well, because you see, I mean, I think biographically th there wasn't any chance for them even to meet, uh, as mm. far as I understand. And as far as the Ukrainian famine is concerned, uh, of course, Gareth Jones uh, was a remarkable man and mm. he was bravely signing his articles about the Ukrainian mm. 
uh, famine. But before him, there were three articles by Michael Margaret that mm. were unsigned in Manchester Guardian. And right. he described uh, the Ukrainian famine. So there is much more reason to believe uh, that as or became friends with Malcolm Magridge, that he uh, could have learned maybe additional detail from him. Yeah. And that, that was just something I thought maybe you will... Yeah. I, I, I think the I think the sort of definitive answer is going to is going to come from looking at the operational archives of the Western Mail in Cardiff, right? Uh, okay. And uh, you know, that's uh, that, that, that's on that's on my to do list. Right. Uh, well, I, I wish I wish you I wish you luck in, in this in this search. That would be well, as, 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 interesting. Yeah. as soon as I find anything, you'll be the first to know. Thank you. And just, just um, I was a small comment. I was a bit surprised that you quote uh, this uh, famous uh, words of Orwell, I belong to the left, and uh, uh, so on, uh, from uh, the evidence of uh, Woodcock, while this letter to Duchess Atoll is uh, published in uh, uh, Davison's uh, in volume 17, page 385 so it, it's it's a published letter um, mm. and yeah so it's it just just for uh, for the future for the future work thank you very much okay uh, who else would like to ask a question if not I'll just make a, a, a little question myself David why do you think people like Wells and Shaw were so enamoured of the Soviet Union? I think they, they didn't have the depth of inquiry that, um, that Orwell did. I mean, um, you know, at, at, at some points in history, you can call, um, you know, Orwell a, re a, a real sceptic. And, you know, and, and I do mean a healthy sceptic um, as well. And I think, obviously, um, Wells and Shaw were pretty much what you may call um, spiritual socialists, where um, there was nothing spiritual about George Orwell at all. And, um, and I think that um, th th that is the difference. And um, it also looks at sort of, um, in, in certainly in, you know, people like, um, if I mention another name, uh, or two other names, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, I mean, their, um, their book, you know, Soviet Communism and New Civilization, it's absolutely dreadful um, work. And it's just, you know, blatantly ignoring all kinds of things that were right in front of their um, of their faces. I'm not saying that Wells and Shaw were um, motivated to that extent. But um, I think that they're... The, the, they, they were perhaps carried along by the spirituality of um, wanting the perfect state of mankind in a social and economic sense. I'm not saying that uh, you know they wanted you know um, people doing all this compulsory sport like they did in Nazi Germany, um, etc. But this this perfect state of mankind is a real sort of preoccupation, and um, they've been presented with that as the driving as the driving ideal and. Um, um, people that I knew in the sort of 1980s who were um, supporters of the Soviet Union just did not want to engage and you know these are some people that I thought of as being quite intellectual did not want to engage, want to engage with the dictatorship excesses um, of that and it's uh, it's quite a strange thing to come to terms with. Thank you very much David. Uh, Les and then, and then Peter. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. Um, um, I, I just want to point out, going back to the Umberto Eco, yeah. um, that his points come from an essay which he called um, Ur, You Are uh, Fascism, which appeared in the, the New York Review of Books. And part of it is, is definitely available online. The whole, the whole document may be av available online. But I think rather than examining what fascism did isn't isn't his essay more a warning of look for these points because if they occur now it shows the re the reoccurrence of fascism yes i'm, I'm really glad that you've um, that you've raised that um les because it, you know it, it gives you a shopping list of criteria um that that, that that constitutes fascism and if you've got more than so many of these then you're well on the road to it um 
But um, I, what I wanted to do was, was to draw a contrast between Umberto Eco's um, real in-depth analysis, a tremendously you know, worthy in-depth analysis of uh, fascism, and Orwell almost like dis dismissing it as a joke. You know, and, um, when, when I first read about his attendance of, um, of, um, of, of a Mosley meeting um, up north, probably in Wigan, um, and he just, you know, dismisses it as, you know, something, you know, stupid or um, his usual claptrap um, is, the, um, um, is, the, is the phrase. And, um, you know, he sees it as a spurious, a really spurious ideology. And um, he hasn't, Orwell doesn't seem to expand, expend much time into sort of um, analysing what are the elements of fascism and what's its appeal, as, as Echo does. Small point, it was Barnsley. Barnsley, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it, yeah, uh, but but, but um, Orwell in his diary, the, the, uh, the, the opening words of that diary entry are, I was dismayed to hear no one oppose Mosley. So um, although in, in that diary entry there is no in-depth analysis, he does identify that mm. his, his, his dismay. Mm. I, I know this diary entry because coming up on the um, on our Facebook page there will be a link to the new exhibition which is opening at the uh, the uh, Viner is it Viner uh, Institute in London on uh, the domestic life under fascism. Um, so keep an eye on our Facebook page and and you'll be able to uh, to get there um, yeah. from from our link. Yeah. Thank just, you. Going, just going back to your point about um, um, I was surprised that nobody uh, questioned or interrupted uh, Mosley. If you look at uh, film footage of Mosley's meetings, um, those who question or interrupt um, um, do get a, a certain type of treatment. It, it, it does occur. I mean, there is film of the um, of the Olympia meeting where people were being beaten up. Yeah. But Mosley also had the advantage of the law. Um, that they simply had to announce at the beginning of the meeting that the Public Order uh, Act of 1936 would be applied, and effectively they were allowed to beat up and chuck out anybody they objected to. Thank you. Uh, thank Peter. You. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, just a comment. The Justice Vassal, in fact, was a sort of figure both, both of the left and the right in the sense that she was a fervent supporter of the loyalists uh, during, during the Spanish Civil War. But my more basic question, if I understood you correctly, uh, you, you, said, you, you said at the very end that Orwell felt that all revolutions on, uh, on behalf of socialism uh, were bound to end in a totalitarian state. And I think rather, uh, he, he obviously had that as a, as a, as a great fear but it seemed to me, particularly, say, in Animal Farm and elsewhere, he was arguing, he, he had perhaps, uh, one might think it's uh, almost t too straightforward, maybe even simple-minded. It, 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 it seemed to me he was continually saying that there's a, the, the solution, the solution in order to prevent a socialist revolution culminating in a totalitarian state, it's a continual change of leadership. And I think actually when people work out at Animal Farm how it corresponds uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, events in, uh, in, in Russia, <clears throat> that they, they pinpoint the Kronstadt uh, uh, uprising, the suppression of that, the indication that power is going to be more important than socialism. So I think that, the, well, it, it, that there was a combination in Orwell of deep pessimism about the success of, of a socialist revolution, combined though with a solution to his mind that, that it would be possible if there was a, a, a continual change of leadership in order to make sure that the leaders didn't want to just stay there in order to preserve power. So I, I don't think if I understood you correctly that he was quite as absolutely pessimistic as I thought you were saying. Yeah, um, I, d I didn't um, sort of refer to socialist revolutions, um, um, you know, um, as a, as a particular case. But uh, my understanding of Orwell, you know, however limited my reading or understanding was, that um, you know, revolutions per se um, eventually um, cr uh, cr create dictatorships, um, or mostly create um, create dictatorships, and. Um, 
on that point of you know the sort of changing or um, re removal of leaders, um, etc. I mean, if we look at most socialist revolutions across history, they have collapsed. Um, even you know the Soviet Union um, collapsed, and you know China's converted itself into some kind of crypto capitalistic um, capitalistic society, and. Um, but in terms of um, you know sort of changes of um, changes of leadership, I mean, we we see that you know socialism you know does does work in democratic societies. I mean, um, the Labour Party in 1912 um, had um, or took part in this second international um, meeting, which included um, the um, the revolutionary elements of the Ro Russian Social Democratic Party in 1912. And um, the British Labour Party decided in 1912 it was going to be a parliamentary um, socialist party and not um, a revolutionary um, party and those debates still run on um, in the Labour Party um, in, in the UK today but in, in terms of taking that back to um, back to Orwell I mean um, Orwell isn't pessimistic about socialism per se Orwell is pessimistic about using revolutions to underpin power or to attain power um, that's um, that, that's my that's my reading of it anyway well, as you pointed out, and, and I hope at a later point in March, maybe to talk more about the lion and the unicorn. Uh, um, at that point, he, he, he was very pro-revolution. Mm. Yeah, he was um, in, in the lion and the unicorn. Um, Orwell, um, I think, you know, sort of shares that view that sh sh shares a view with Karl Marx that um, British workers are the most conservative in the world. And um, in The Lion and the Unicorn, um, he says that, you know, a revolution would, or you know, to, to paraphrase him, the, um, the revolution would never, a revolution would, 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 would never take place or, or, or never be sustained um, in Britain because, um, of, because it's just an, an anathema to, um, to, to British values in, in as much as he, he sees most people as being middle class or wanting to be middle class. More pro revolution in Lion and the Unicorn. I think he changes his mind. In the Lion and the Unicorn itself, he, he wants a revolution and thinks it's necessary in order to win the war, which yeah. allowed, it turned out not to be true. Yeah, sure, for sure. Uh, sure. But then, um, obviously, later, by the time we get to 1945 and uh, 46, when he's seen what's happened in Sovietized Europe, um, his mind has changed very quickly. I think the essence of all this at the end of the day these sort of regimes mm. it's all about a rigid control of, of of people and and you know that's where where uh, his warning in 1984 led him mm. yeah and uh, you, you you are right um peter to an extent in that in as much as you know he um he, sh he sees you know sort of social change profound social change as something optimistic but then by the time he reaches towards the end of his life he's very very pessimistic about it although uh, but he, 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 there was profound social change in the labor government i mean now obviously a total socialist state and, and in a way he uh, he was very approving of it Yes, he was. I mean, um, you know, if, if, if we read um, the, the final final part of the line and the unicorn, um, he he talks about you know how um, Eton disappears and um, you have um, socialized control and nationalization of industries and a comprehensive welfare service, but England still looks the same. And of course, Eton didn't did disappear, and he he almost he, he was told Richard, uh, we, we, Richard can talk to them about that. Uh, going there yeah well e eaton wants to open up a sixth form college near to where i live even it's so it's uh, it's growing we will be going to eaton um in october we'll have a uh, uh, an event there on october the 5th um numbers will be in inevitably limited by the fact that it's a school um but, the, but, but we'll, we'll have about 15 of us able to go and see firsthand what we think any other questions, please? Well, uh, no. In that case, uh, can we all thank David for his, for his talk? And uh, I look forward to seeing you all uh, on all the occasions that uh, we've talked about earlier.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.